Welcome once again to the SciArc uh, Spring Lecture Series. This is the third to the final one. Um, this evening the uh, format continues with two people lecturing with a moderator uh, who will introduce both speakers. It's uh, Ken Breisch, uh, who is an architectural historian. He's been teaching here at the school for I don't know, probably five or six years um, from Chicago, so I think he, he has a sort of special feelings about uh, Stanley. So with that, here's Ken Breisch to introduce the two speakers. And afterwards, uh, the, the, uh, the objective is uh, for all of you to ask questions moderated by Ken uh, of the two speakers, okay? Good evening. Um, it's nice to be asked to moderate these things because then you know you have a seat at least. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to uh, what is the fifth, I guess, in a series of lectures entitled Dreams, Beliefs, and Fantasies, uh, which was organized this semester by the uh, second year undergraduate class who've done a spectacular job. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is just briefly introduce the two speakers uh, who will uh, give their presentations and then we'll have a short uh, discussion, uh, hopefully, uh, and then field questions from the audience. Uh, tonight's speakers uh, will be Victoria Kosasko and Stanley Tigerman. Uh, our first speaker tonight will be Victoria Kosasko, who is the principal in her own architecture firm in Venice, uh, the Victoria Kosasko Studio. She also currently teaches design studio here at SciArc, having previously taught at uh, Cal State Pomona and Mississippi State University. Victoria brings to her practice not only a, a degree in sculpture from the Rhode Island School of Design and a Master of Architecture from the Graduate School of Architecture and Planning at Columbia, but a long-standing interest in town planning. <clears throat> the former and the latter, uh, a strong sculptural sensibility and an abiding interest in urban context, uh, I think are evident in her, as you'll see this evening, sensual handling of structure and materials, uh, exploration of um, the oppositions inherent uh, in minimalist geometries uh, and sensitivity to sight. Um, as you'll also see this evening, she's built widely in Barcelona, Spain, New York, Florida, and Los Angeles, uh, and is currently developing plans for a community in Arizona. Her work, too, has been exhibited widely and published in magazines such as Metropolitan Home and Progressive Architecture. Victoria will be followed uh, by our second speaker, Stanley Tigerman, um, who probably needs no introduction, uh, but who I will mention as a principal in the Chicago firm of Tigerman McCurry and a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Having received his degrees in architecture from Yale, Mr. Tigerman is currently the director of the School of Architecture at the University of Illinois at Chicago. The author of articles, uh, much too, many too numerous to recount, uh, and half a dozen books, Stanley Tigerman's intellectual curiosity has ranged as widely as his uh, built work, which since the early 1960s, um, he has used to uh, explore a vast and varied landscape of metaphors and illusions that invoke everything from the platonic and anthropomorphic geometries of classicism, uh, a subject near to my heart, uh, from that all the way to uh, suburban American popular culture. This has resulted not only in an impressive body of work, uh, much of which you'll see this evening, um, uh, and can also see in a recently published monograph by Rizzoli, uh, but also in the accumulation of some uh, 80 design, uh, design awards. Uh, his work has also been included in uh, over 200 uh, architectural exhibitions. Uh, I'd like to start this evening by welcoming uh, Victoria Kosasko. Well, thanks a lot, Ken. Except for I haven't been published in PA yet. <clears throat> Exaggerations, they won't harm me. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm going to quickly take you through uh, several explorations, explorations in sculpture, architecture, and planning. And um, th the reason I have these two slides up is because I feel like I'm wearing several different hats between 
the sculpture which I've done, the architecture which I'm doing, the planning which I'm involved in, in the process of interacting with, and th that kind of shift in scale, you, you sort of have to change your hats all the time. And, um, and the initial, uh, the, the handout that everybody got for this lecture series said that uh, there somehow was a constant ski a theme throughout the work, which in fact, I had to like really rack my brain to find what that constant theme was. Maybe some of you will see it, maybe some of you won't. And um, so not only is scale shifting back and forth in terms of the work that I'm doing, but also as a result of that skift and shale, the conceptual frameworks are constantly being inflected by conditions which reality is itself, itself uh, inflects. The, the conceptual over here and the real condition over here, and that kind of interaction somehow alters the initial conceptual framework or formal framework that you wanted to start with. Um, I look at my work as an ongoing and inclusive set of explorations which are always in progress. I don't see them as closures but as something which is ever evolving. And uh, the various directions and conceptual frameworks which I've chosen to explore um, might be likened to a series of trajectories which are constantly crossing over each other. Uh, principally because, again, the practice of architecture, uh, within that practice of architecture, we respond to the shifting, shifting socio and economic conditions and those parameters. And those parameters ultimately inflect and at times redirect um, deeper desires which we hold and uh, which are multivalent. I mean, our, our desires, spiritual, economical, physical, mental, are constantly being inflected in the actual practice of the work because of the client and the budget, et cetera. So these deeper desires might be uh, any combination of the spiritual, conceptual, exper experiential, or ethical aspirations towards the work, but each project through its diverse set of relationships, I see it's like, a, it's an inter interactive framework from which and from which in a heightened awareness of one's own physical, mental, spiritual condition may be brought about. So that in a sense is my aspiration in the kind of work that I do. Um, or a, a, a quote from T.S. Eliot, um, this is a partial quote, uh, is one of his aspirations in the work which he found very difficult to do was to make the common, the everyday uncommon. So, so that in other words, to perceive and experience the everyday in a new way. And I, my attempt, I think, in my work is to, to, to arrive at that kind of, a, a new awareness of what a wall might be, a space might be, a house might be, a town might be. Um, the work is constantly evolving and reacting to given conditions as a series of transformations which are open and concerned with processes of trans, uh, trans, transcendence through the transformations of reality. Transformation of reality meaning taking that what is common and altering it so that your perception of it might be renewed. Uh, I guess I have to push these. So, <clears throat> so to begin with, um, some of the work that I did as a sculptor, which is Again, on, throughout my work, this kind of stuff keeps coming back to me. And um, th this series was in, entitled Corner Conversations. And uh, there was a preoccupation with um, that which lies beyond, <clears throat> beyond the corner and its invisible yet subtly perceived um, conditions. And actually taking um, the viewer all of a sudden in these kind of um, sculptures which involve human beings, not sculpted forms, the viewer actually becomes the object. What, it's an experiential thing. The, um, I've sort of lost my track of mind here. Um, th there's a kind of blurring going on between the two figures, the corner, and then after this piece I did, uh, or during the same installation that I did of these pieces, um, I did another piece which was called Skirting the Corner, an installation of these pieces of tar paper actually flung against the corners of a room that was maybe 12 by 12 feet with a video running constantly uh, entitled Unveiling the Moving Corner, the video actually showing the corner opening and closing. So 
again, this concern for what lies beyond, beyond the, the perceptible. And uh, let's see here. So these were just, you know, two of the pieces in the room that were like six feet high. This kind of the concern again of what's be, be behind what you're seeing. Um, those installations that I showed you were extremely site specific and very much about that which lies beyond. And these, this piece here, which is a piece of slate the size of, you know, like 1920s school blackboard, is simply inclined against a wall and <clears throat> Uh, formally, it, it was cut in such a way so that it actually looks like it's billowing out and again referring to that the space behind what you're seeing. And this piece equally has more to do with, um, with the interiority of the space within the exterior form that you're reading. And this is a house now, sort of several years afterwards, which I actually designed in collaboration with another engineer in uh, Barcelona <clears throat> and um, it took three and a half years to build so I've been waiting a long time for this one. It, um, the house it ha has a lot to do with contradictions, uh, not, not contradictions um, with very very different conditions. The orthogonal here and the curvilinear here and there's this kind of juxtaposition that goes on throughout the house uh, between those two ideas. Uh, yeah, this is sort of to give you a little bit of context and the way in which this project was uh, influenced. Is there's a, a rigorous modernist movement in, uh, in Barcelona. The, here's the Mies Pavilion and then on the other side you have Gaudí with his usual iron work and um, my real interest was, I, I find them both quite beautiful movements that are occurring now in Barcelona, along with the incredible uh, craftsmanship and the building technologies there. So th these are t just two examples of uh, cultural architectural conditions that exist in Barcelona today, and modern architects in Barcelona are actually uh, idiosyncratically at times mixing these two. These are the diagrams of the house uh, sh showing my, my interest in really uh, dealing with the exterior landscape and the interior of the house as a series of interminglings, uh, the spaces coming in and out of each other. On the right hand side is the main living area with the two major splayed walls as the uh, dining living area. The pool is actually you can see it maybe better in the sketch here is actually pulling into the living area. The dining area is a teak deck which actually projects out. So there's the, the, the windows of the children's rooms on the other side there actually project into the pool. So there is, um, so the interest in really like, uh, in, in not de-objectifying, that's not the word that I can use on this house, but to, to really intermesh the landscape with the built form, the interior of the built form. Um, so th that on the right is the upper level garage um, with master suite and entry hall. And I don't, could you, yeah. This is the plan that we had to do because it's an extremely, a very, very steep site. The client wanted a uh, David Hockney landscape, which is basically flat with the pool grass and two big palm trees <laughs> and at the same time he wanted uh, a completely organic no straight walls scheme well I we had to bring the um, these uh, the uh, orthogonal walls into the scheme in order to make any sense out of this sloping site in order to build it so the grid was actually superimposed over the geometry of the house which established all the ta tangent points as you went up and down the hillside. And in order to get this uh, David Hockney-esque <laughs> notion that the client had, we actually had to build up the site on a series of plinths which eventually became cord and concrete um, retaining walls. In section there you can see you enter up on the upper level down to the living level with the pool. You can actually go under the pool and there's a whole another playroom and guest room there. Um, 
so in the model you can kind of see the initial conceptual evolution of the house and the house is as it is built now I might have a better slide showing the well, another thing about this house that um, it, it, uh, diametrically opposed kind of conditions the uh, the whole front of the house is actually, I might have another one here. The front of the house here is all board in place of concrete, very horizontal, <clears throat> almost rectilinear, as opposed to the back of the house, which is all curvilinear. Um, the, these curvilinear walls are actually treated like planes, which are separated from those concrete walls. So there's this kind of uh, austerity of the front and sensuality that's occurring on the face, south uh, face of the house. And again, you know, the front entry is somewhat of an urban gesture in a very, as a typical suburban uh, neighborhood like you might find in LA, uh, trying to sort of redefine that, the turn along the street. <clears throat> and underneath those cypress trees is a whole other garden which you'll see later uh, this is uh, I might mention that in Barcelona uh, I worked with an engineer on the project in collaboration with him and then later another architect did all this construction supervision who's there and um, here you can start to see these splayed, the splayed walls of the, 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 the limestone covered part of the house is actually built out of uh, double cavity load bearing brick with poured in place uh, floor slabs uh, covered in limestone. The rest of it is all exposed. And, and these are some of the views of the entry of the house coming into it. And it's sort of a nice detail of the, uh, the um, privacy screens that we use uh, around the house that are um, angled in such a way that <clears throat> you can still get the um, the west light coming in, but the east light in the eastern port of the portion of the house is where the private, uh, the client wanted most of his privacy to come from. So we simply uh, shifted the the angle of the the pickets, the steel pickets, so that it's either black or at a certain point you can see right straight through them. And the other thing that we did is working with these kind of planar relationships is to actually separate planes whenever openings occurred. That's the main entry there. And again, this um, here, the inside of these are the stairs going down and a skylight in the main entry, but really trying to work with a very dynamic set of uh, curvilinear forms within the interior and exterior of the house. Um, the garage, actually, which is beyond this and still in the main entry hall, has a whole panoramic view of. Barcelona. So you drive into the garage and you have all of Barcelona behind, uh, in front of you. And this is just a detail of a, uh, a very small window coming into the master suite beyond. And these are some more details of the entry. And this is the master suite, which is on the first entry level, views of the city again. And um, as you're coming out of the master bedroom, you come out onto this um, upper deck area, which um, here you can see the garage windows kind of splaying around. But um, what I found in this project is working with uh, the curvilinear is a completely new ball game. That, I, I went to Barcelona, and people have said, oh, Victoria, you shouldn't say this, but I went there wanting to find out what are all the mistakes were. <laughs> So the, the next time I do this project, it, you know, it's perfect. This house, I'll show you later, when you're working with a curvilinear, you know, you, you draw it in plan and you think, well, aesthetically the plan looks right, but you really can't do that. You have to approach it strictly volumetrically from the outside with the lots and lots of models. And these are some more views of the upper deck, the triangular windows that are from the children's rooms that open straight onto the pool. And the children's stairs going down, which actually go down, these are the stairs that go down underneath the pool of the house. And as you're going down those stairs, you, there's a window that into the pool that's like uh, four feet in diameter. And that then takes you down underneath the playroom to an, another lower level garden. 
So now back inside the house, we're going down to the living area, which, um, which in the living area, I don't know if you remember the first diagram, but the, the pool actually pulls into it. Although under construction, uh, we missed two feet of it. The, the pool was actually supposed to come straight in. Here you can also see how uh, the, the, all the windows in the house are articulated differently so that they don't follow the, uh, they don't follow the exterior form of the house. They act as in independent elements, which you can kind of see here. And in Spain, you always have service entries so, uh, and laundry, extra laundry area. So behind these concrete walls is a service entry and drawing area. And then here you have a series of steel, steel louvers which uh, mask the garage area above, giving it a little bit of enough light. And then the uh, maids area below for, um, for the trash, et cetera, stuff like that. And here's the children's room again in the detail of, um, in order to get this kind of um, this slightly cantilevered curve coming out of the uh, living area, we, we put steel channels in to break, to break that. And here, it, you know, Connor posed with this curve at the end of the house, you get these very, um, uh, what would I call them, pointy? I don't know what word to use. Um, you, you get very, it contrasts with the sensuality of the curve, you get these very, very, very sharp uh, endpoints. And each, again, I talked about the splaying of the curve. Each one of these has a different function between, which separates them. Uh, but the first one has a sauna going into it, that, which is a steel louver door again, which then up above becomes a rail. Uh, the second one is actually up above is a window area with uh, planting for the master bathroom and then the children's exit below and the second and uh, third set of stairs here for the gardener and uh, the guest room which is actually underneath the, in the fourth level of the house. So the, you know, another set of contrasting relationships is that this is very horizontal. Um, upper level garden that you have with the pool and then you go down into a very, very um, a deep shadow, it was deep space shadow with the cypress. And this is the, the lower plinth that's actually in part supporting that pool. Out of which, you know, the playroom is out there, they sort of have their, their private play area down there which is more protected. <laughs> So, and this is another, this is the project I came out actually um, to do here in Spain. The Booth resident uh, in New York, no, LA, I'm in LA now. <clears throat> and um, again, I inflect the, the living space, which is on the upper left corner there. I inflect it towards views of the Pacific and the canyons beyond, um, working with the intermeshing of interior exterior spaces again. Uh, the only case in this house, I wasn't working with the same kind of building technology, important place, concrete walls and load bearing bricks. So we ended up doing these kind of schematics um, proposals uh, with steel frame and actually using uh, for, for the, um, the, the massive parts of the house or the planar parts of the house to use um, actually very thin concrete panels that would be applied. So these are sort of like night and day views of that scheme. But the just, again, you know, in the, the Barcelona house juxtaposition of uh, the, the orthogonal with the organic, this kind of set of, set of contrast that I, which I seem to find myself working with. And spatially, it, it creates an incredible set of events that you can be walk through and be through in a building that I find very stimulating. This, in lieu of actually doing the Booth residence, um, I redid their uh, bathroom, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, <clears throat> the, the bathroom actually uh, was, the idea was that we'll fix our bathroom and next year you will do the house. So I, I designed the bathroom in such a way, it, there was an existing gutted out what was in there. 
uh, in such a way that it was treated like an installation and um, all the elements can be taken down prior to demolition of the house and they could have been installed in the new one. Um, there's a kind of poetry going on in here for me in that um, th there are two mirrors that are actually suspended by the steel frame back to back and um, there kind of, I, I saw these kind of memory planes between um, the two participants, the husband and wife, where they're actually looking into the mirror, but they're actually looking through the mirror into themselves. And th th that kind of dialectic between you're actually looking at yourself, but the, you know that the other person is there too because you probably get up at the same time and um, sort of taking you into another dimension. And these are just some of the details of that steel frame which a lot, a lot of the work I had to do myself because um, of the budget. So, and some of the details of the doors and they slide, slide in and out, the cabinets. Sandblasting existing um, marble stairs. This was his, his light fixture with a <coughs> vertical phallic bulb and um, her light fixture uh, with two circular bosom bulbs. <laughs> um, and these were just uh, a very small little project, but this kind of goes back to a house that I'll show you later in Seaside. The, the, work, the notion of working with the, over, uh, the, the transparencies through grids. And um, the interesting thing about this project is that it, um, it was done, there are lighting fixtures that are like four by eight feet that can be installed in any, um, any corporate office with drop ceilings and fluorescent light fixtures that are pretty hard on the eyes. But th these are simply suspended um, two inches below the drop ceiling on rods. And they actually give wonderful light. They're aluminum, square punched aluminum uh, pieces bolted together with an anodized aluminum frame to support the thing so that it doesn't sag. Real, very inexpensive. Uh, this is a house in Florida, which um, doesn't look like it's going to get built, unfortunately. She, um, the, she's a grandmother with 17 offspring, so she could never make up her mind about what she wanted. and. Um, here again, I'm working with a very systematic, which you see in this kind of initial diagrammatic sketches, uh, systematic structural grid um, <clears throat> off of which this kind of organic meandering form um, intervenes through it, which has to do with the landscape and it has to do with the upper levels of the house. Here in the site plan, uh, well, I probably don't need to show you that, but it's a really long, long linear site plan. Um, all of the, the inflection here, this is a, a glue lamb <coughs> framing for all the, the rows of the house, which are all exposed. Uh, it, it, again, inflecting out towards views of the Gulf Coast and the, um, and the lake beyond. I tend to do that a lot of in, in the projects, to sort of like shift the house in order to get like uh, this, uh, views of the sunset and views of the water, which well, the house is 18 by 52 feet, very low budget. 50% um, of the house is exterior screen. The other 50% is interior. Uh, the main shear walls are all concrete uh, block. And here in the plants, you can, the first level, which is on the left, is 13 feet high for summer living and um, guests. <clears throat> the second level is um, eight to nine feet high because this roof is slightly canted uh, for winter living. Uh, to the right is the screen porch area with this volume kind of intersecting, which is, which is the kitchen and below a work area. And th these are just some more details of the house. And this was an initial scheme I did, again, 18 feet wide. Um, with the hurricane codes there, I felt that we needed to brace the bottom of the house so that it wouldn't like sway back and forth. The client didn't like it, so we ended up changing the scheme slightly and adding cross bracing 
along that this left portion which is all screened in an exterior and this is a house I did at Seaside I'm doing pretty good oh. uh, at Seaside which um, I think most of you know about I would think anyway I was involved with the uh, initial planning of Seaside the, the planning meaning two-dimensional planning I didn't get involved with um, the building types that they actually studied in depth nor with the writing of the uh, the restrictions which architects have in terms of materials um, and um, material setbacks, the requirement of eight and 12 pitch roofs. And Seaside, I might just mention, was based in part, the, the, the three dimensional aspect of that master plan really tried to look at the Southern vernacular architecture and um, develop a town that was very regional in that sense. My fascination was with this it's kind of typical framing that you find uh, because in northern Florida it's all wood construction and very very good skilled craftsmen there so uh, I started taking that kind of um, the notion of this structural uh, two by four or six by eight um, wood frame and, and started to shift it and articulate it in such a way that um, the site was, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the site parameters here, but it's rectilinear. We built the maximum envelope possible. We had required eight-foot setbacks for porches. We had required wood siding for exterior horizontal. Required uh, max, uh, the principal roof eight and 12 pitch. Um, any open, any, any part or portion of the structure without a roof on it had to be an uh, usable deck area. So in section here, very different in terms of the vocabulary, but, but like in the house in Spain, I'm actually interweaving interior and exterior spaces, but through built form, not through the landscaping, because we hardly had any exterior landscaping available to us. So this uh, hole on this bottom drawing here, it's all exterior screen with then a shutter room, which is an exterior space above the main living area. So you sort of get this interlocking of inside to outside in that house. And uh, the, the house is at one time abstract and, at the one t and uh, on the other hand, very figurative. The client wanted a house that said seaside. He wanted to have that gable stick out onto the street. So, um, I, I can't say I compromised, but I definitely worked with what the client, with, with what the client wanted, and with, with what I wanted. So here, I, ah, the other thing is, is the eight and twelve pitch roof bothered me so much that um, I actually, in the project, um, slipped it out as if it looks like it's falling off, and I, I almost prefer it without it. Um, these are some uh, photographs of um, the house. We use six by eight um, balloon frame construction. They're like 22 feet high, then uh, bolted to pilings that go 15 feet into the ground. And the upper level there, um, the, so basically the structural framing goes up through the whole house. The house is very well caulked. It's, all, it's actually treated like a boat because you have all these structural members coming in, inside and outside of spaces. and. Um, it rains there for about three months a year like uh, we have never seen in California. So you really have to make it airtight. The house actually sways in the wind. It was designed to, um, to not only have the roof blow off in the event of a hurricane. <laughs> well, so the rest of the house at least stays in place. But, but actually the, um, the whole screen enclosure around the house, which is exterior, is, is designed to move slightly. So in a heavy storm, you do feel like you're on a boat. And again, uh, working with this, the notion of this shifting grids and reading through layers of, 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 of grids like you might in a Japanese house, but here the space was a little more limited. This house is uh, 1,200 square feet inside and overall, with, including the exterior, something like 1,800 square feet, it's tiny. 
And the, my gesture to the city of Seaside with the gable roof. <coughs> and these are just some more details of that framing. And some of the, it, the um, when the the structural frame is is not exposed on the outside, um, it, it it's exposed on the inside. And so there's this kind of um, again juxtaposition between the solid and the planar going on here. And these are just some you know, the light fixtures which I did, which um, you saw earlier. The larger ones that I did for the fluorescent uh, fixtures. These are just smaller, sm again aluminum frames that are bolted together. This is the, uh, well, just different views of the house. And going up the stairs, the shutter room up, up above that space. Here you're up on the upper uh, secondary level exterior space, which then takes you up to an upper deck. And the, the shutter room in the house. Now I think we, okay. We have w just five more slides, okay. Well, I might start talking. This is a, um, a site of my project in Arizona in Scottsdale. I won't show you my project because it's not there yet. But, um, you know, the thing that's so amazing in American subdivision planning is that nothing ever hooks up with anything. You have that privately held parcel, which uh, so, some developer managed to, managed to get 20 to 40 to 60 to 100 the 200 acres and they deal with it as if, as if it was just a larger extension of a small lot. And so what you end up with is this patchwork of different communities which don't link up to each other that, are, uh, that only have one use, which is residential, with the exception of the Mayo Clinic, which is um, to the lower right. Um, Italiasin is four minutes away. I think Frank Lloyd Wright would probably turn in his grave if he saw what was going on here. but. The, these, uh, the center linear blocks are 2,600 20, feet long. The, the, this kind of planning is, it does not um, support any kind of notion of pedestrian activity. Since it's only residential, you have to get onto a main arterial road in order to buy, buy anything, so you're completely reliant on the car. Public spaces, public community spaces are never even considered. Um, on the left, right, we have seaside, which is, um, now did we get a pointer? Uh, well, this seaside fits into uh, one, two, three, four, seven at the top. That's the deviation of that. Um, where it says eight fill area detail, area area detail up in there, basically one, two, three, uh, seven, cut out. At a point, I'd be able to show it to you. But it's incredible. I mean, the kind of uh, detail, which and and activity and building uses and and uh, building types that are in this 80 acre site are completely different from this kind of planning. This kind of planning is just it's monolithic. It's all the cool de sac over here and the meandering roads that everybody seems to like over here. None of which hook up to anything except for the arterial road. Um, seaside, on the other hand, is you know fits into like a very small area there, and has um, eight different kinds of residential building types. It has commercial, it has civic buildings, it has recreational areas. There are at least eight different neighborhoods in this 180-acre plan, whereas in this larger scheme, which is 160 acres with the hor horizontal 2,600-foot-long streets, you know there's one building type one building set back and nothing but houses. So um, 
And the plan, you know, the, the plan of Seaside, I think, is really brilliant and it works. It's very pedestrian oriented. You can walk to the beach, you can walk to the store, you can go to work there. You don't have to even get in your car when you live there. The problem, what ha what, what, real problem with Seaside is that Andres Duwani um, and the developer decided to write a very strict building uh, design guideline which basically on each of those lots gives you like one or two parties to work with and that's it. So not only that, the developer <coughs> has such a strong hold on anything that goes on in the city in terms of the, in the build stuff. Aesthetically, if he doesn't like it, it won't go up. And his wife um, actually determines all the color schemes. <laughs> so, you know, the idea in Seaside was that you can see that there's smaller and larger lots. It was going to be a mixed economic community, mixed use community. Um, the property values went up so high because it was so successful that, you know, the poor people absolutely, the people who work in the shops there can't live there because it's too expensive. But uh, the modulation of the lot sizes is important, but then in the, um, the um, building guidelines, they basically, they force you to do a Charleston type or a Savannah type house. And um, that, I, that's, that's unfortunately three dimensional um, development of this plan is unfortunate. I mean, Andres called it going from Kansas to Oz, you know, just, there were good intentions here, which the economic economics in terms of development didn't allow us to do. So um, it, my involvement with planning besides this Arizona project, which I'm not going to show you, and another one in Chico, California, which I also did with Andres, has been mainly in education, because I get so frustrated working with the developers at this point. I find that um, the kind, my, my own work in planning for the next few years is mainly going to be through teaching and through exploring different options <coughs> that are alternate options to you know, even just looking at a typical street. I mean, we have uh, many traditional neighborhoods, many traditional ways of looking at streets. There, there are many alternate solutions that I don't think we've even begun to explore. These are two. Um, and this was a Cal Poly scheme that I did last year um, in which I had 17 students that all came up with their own I initial schematic master plan and it was a very collaborative effort so what we did is we actually overlaid these are two of the over we overlaid three different schemes and then came up with uh, this was a group model that the students did fighting like cats and dogs but we got it <laughs> The, uh, the initial schematic master, master model, and which later developed into um, an actual plan. I, actually, I'd like to go back. The scheme on the right, it has a 300 by 300 foot grid, which is a very walkable kind of condition when you set it up that way. And the scheme on the left actually <clears throat> is, is site sensitive in that the student took existing water and sewer lines on this desert site off of Route 66. And the water and sewer lines always run in the direction of this um, the downward slope. So um, the San Bernardino Mountains are up, to, up, 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 up at the top. <coughs> so the, um, the intention behind this kind of, this kind of uh, approach was pedestrian orientation so that you, you, you don't have to walk 2,600 feet in order to go to see your neighbor like, you know, a block away. Um, mixed uses are all over the place. A mixture between industrial, commercial, residential, and civic, and public open space. Although there's a main public open space in the center of the scheme that you kind of, kind of begin to see here. And mass, mass transit was explored along Route 66 in order to make that walkable condition with parking uh, actually billowing out of that mass transit system underneath. And these were some of the later models that we developed. The, the drawing on the right um, starts to talk about uh, major public open spaces in, in the master plan. And, uh, the, I think the students really learned a lot about working together that if they're doing a project that uh, one student had this square area here on the lower 
right here mixture of housing two and three story housing with courtyards and retail scattered scattered retail on the lower level uh, this student had to work with the guy adjacent to him another person behind him so there was this kind of um, uh, they all left the studio really feeling that the next time they do a project they're going to either consider the future possibilities of beyond the, the parameters of their privately held parcel they're going to think about the street, the, the implications of the project for the next 10 years, you know, how, what kind of precedent are they setting. And so these are just some other views of that model. And I guess, well, I'm just going to read something sort of quickly as an Andy. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well. Uh, yeah. Well. <laughs> Our urban and suburban structures lack any larger vision or coherence today. Particular, in particular, the suburban developments that are being done all over the United States. And I, I believe it's largely due, due to the fact that architects have chosen not to be involved in reshaping the built environment at that scale. And um, I mean, Andres Duane is always saying in all his lectures that you know, we have all these Ivy League, Ivy League architects, the architects doing you know, like really beautiful projects that are mainly interiors or small scale projects on a small lot. And um, you know, they, they never evolve them, they never want to lower themselves to involve themselves with suburban developments tract houses for lower income people possibly. Um, even looking at commercial centers and how to, how to make those commercial centers uh, interact better with the residential. Very few people are actually doing that that are architects. A lot of planners are doing it, but not architects. And I, I think as architects, we need to bring back this kind of collective poetic that we do in our, that we are attempting to do in our work into the public realm of experiences and only if we begin to think beyond the parameters of that partic particular parcel or building that you're doing, can we in fact bring some kind of poetic back in, into our greater context? And we need to begin to redefine the larger context while we, we're going to continue as architects to objectify the environment with our individual pieces, but at the same time, I would like to see architects becoming more and more involved with the kind of larger scale issues involved with the cities, the small towns, and the neighborhoods. And um, the cities, towns, and suburbs, um, so Larry has kind of an interesting quote about his feelings, especially in Arizona, and these kind of the first picture I showed you. He referred to uh, our inter the, the public's interaction in terms of the planning interaction. He, he put it as that there are tiny lim limbs scattered all over the place with no connections. Basically, like we're throwing these little things all over the place, and there, there's no interconnectedness, no coherence, really no greater vision about how these limbs might come together. And the energy problem spurred by suburban sprawl and its dependence on the automobile is, is actually incredibly dramatic, both in terms of the ecology and, to, and also in terms of our psychological response to actually having to always get into the car to go and do something and to even meet people and encounter people. Um, we seem to live in an age of exterior reasons and internal schizophrenia, in which technology will save us from the death, will save us from death, but will also foreclose the possibility of an, any kind of experiential life. And that's kind of a big statement, but in this case I would, I would say it has to do with the planning and, and the, the fact that we re rely, as a result of the kind of planning that we have so heavily on the car. Um, we're being consumed by seas of asphalt, inefficient and antiquated means of transportation, such as the car, and, and um, as a result, uh, we have, as a result of inappropriate town planning guidelines. We work and live within an ever-expanding sense of isolation, 
in our suburban developments because the whole regions are being planned within a very myo myopic set of uh, visions which are based solely on economic efficiency and privately economic efficiency for the developer and then the privately held parcel parameter which is also another kind of economic condition that the developer has um, rather we should we should be attempting to balance and synthesize attitudes and approaches which are both social and spatial political and physical as architects basically what I'm saying is we should be do we should really be thinking about the streets the open space and the built environment as a potentially very very wonderful condition but if we don't start looking at it it's it's going to be screwed up for a long time to come because you know we're letting people who don't know what they're doing deal with it. They're they're not working collectively. I mean, the Department of Transportation has more power than we do. So, the public sector and new planning seems to be reduced to the streets in L.A. I mean, for sure. And that while the shopping mall, which is uh, capitalizes on public assembly, is uh, privately held and excludes unless you get uh, special permission uh, any possibility of true open assemblage. Uh, rampant suburban sprawl is confining us in cars and is increasingly leading to a society which is both privatized and consumer oriented. New planned developments physically segregate uses and economic routes, creating through privatization economic monocultural cultures and social segregation. Uh, basically, what's happening with these developments is either they're upscale or low scale. There's always an arterial road which separates the two different economic groups. That you can't, kid, children basically are not mixing with different economic groups because it through, as a result of this kind of planning. Um, we cannot pretend to heroically, I don't attempt to, I'm not attempting to tell you that we can heroically reshape um, the conditions of profit sharing and financing and land use, but I think that we can as architects begin to make a difference in the built environment uh, which will engender um, social interaction between people, not via the car, energy efficiency and a real kind of developing real senses of, okay, sense of place, which more than often or not, I mean, I'm speaking of places like Irvine or, or the Inland Empire, where to find a sense of place, you probably have to find a tree in a grove somewhere, not within the built environment. And in order to bring this kind of collective poetic back into the built environment, in order to lessen the mecha mechanical complexities so that two people can meet accidentally, not via broken glass and metal, but rather walking to the local market or park, we need to begin to redesign neighborhoods, small communities, towns, and cities. And it's time that we, as architects and artists, look beyond the parameters of that private, our privately held parcel, the object that we're doing, and that we begin to consider the larger, larger conditions and implications of what we do within that built environment. So I'm not suggesting that you know we should all be doing planning over here and forget all the other stuff. Nor am I suggesting that that architecture all of a sudden, a lot of people think that um, that, um, that social inequity or social problems are like this big weight and they all become very intimidated and you can't deal with this stuff. I just want to do my work, I'm a creative person. On the other hand, I think that we, we have to expand the parameters of our interaction with, with the work that we do and, and start to really, really try and look at the, the, the various different scales that we could be working with them. So, I mean, you can do door handles and you can do buildings and you can do cities. I think you can do it all. I don't think you have to limit yourself to one thing. No, that's it. Thank you very much, Victoria. I'd like to just quickly introduce our next speaker, then uh, Stanley Tigerman. Uh, I'm okay. Yeah, 
see. Good. Can I have the lights, please? Um, I really enjoyed looking at uh, Victoria's work. I don't have a manifesto. Um, and I personally had, which may spark some discussion afterwards, had no problem at all with the level of detail and the sort of frankly, frank brilliance of the way that Victoria is as an architect, but I had a hell of a lot of problems with the manifesto at the end because it seemed to be crying for the very thing that she was, which I happen to agree with, decrying in Andres Duaney in the sense of a cohesiveness. It's not that none of us have concerns about those larger issues, but when you look at the way that she does light fixtures, um, you realize that you're in the presence of of a real architect and somebody who, along with others, as you see in the studio work, shows the potential of a kind of a resistance to a seaside or Williamsburg planned community single overriding force as a mentality to engage in. So I had a lot of problem, Victoria, with the manifesto at the end, frankly, which I think flies in the face of the work, which I think is personally fabulous. In any case, all I'm going to show are seven recent projects um, that uh, are small, or small in the sense that I've always done projects this size um, and have never really, I guess, actually ever done a large project. And over, over the years, I've found ways to make them smaller so that what you see here is a house that's now, I have some Photo, photos near completion that's been broken down that's based on an attitude of a conceit I don't know if this is really going to show very well of symmetry that as you come in and as this thing disintegrates and tries to reintegrate to put itself back together again uh, is the basic attitude of the project itself which goes into the plan into that axonometric which I showed so that you begin in something that is symmetrical uh, of which there's only the smallest hint of the breaking apart of things uh, and is really basically an armature, a kind of village street off of which a series of 16 uh, simple parallelopipeds, cylinders, uh, gable uh, uh, elements and so forth cluster around rotationally using rotation as the device of disintegration and in, in a certain way as a failed attempt to try to reintegrate it as it comes around on the other side. So this is a product, this is it's under construction. We tend not to do porta potties in the finished building. Um, the, uh, I have a practice in Chicago. My wife, Margaret McCurry, is my partner. We do a number of projects together, some independently. This is one we did together um, and is, as you see, nearing completion. Uh, it's on a site that a great deal of landscaping is now uh, 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 surrounding and isolating it. Um, and uh, uh, so we've done the landscaping, we did the interiors, uh, all of the uh, uh, furnishings, the details, built-ins, and so forth. Um, it's, it's a, it has a base course of limestone that runs round that's about my height, and then is stucco and a, a standing seam aluminum roof uh, in the various forms, as you see, of 16 buildings in 16 different colors. Uh, that are both inside and outside. Um, so this shows various aspects of it running around the house itself. And finally, a shot nearing completion on the inside where all of the trim is, uh, is painted in silver with the 16 different elements in different colors coming through. This is a slightly larger project, um, which is now in working drawings. Um, is a housing project in uh, Belgrade uh, where they're having a lot of problems right now. Um, and it's a project not unlike the various German um, uh, projects beginning with the uh, Weisenhof Siedlung in uh, Stuttgart in 1927 and then going to 30 years later in Berlin at Interbau and then 30 years again later where I did a small project in Berlin for the EBA. This in Yugoslavia, they've asked eight architects from around the world to take a site, uh, actually a ring road near the top of a hill 
uh, in the new part of Belgrade, looking down at the Saba and the Danube, which is sort of which really the ed edge of the slide, and um, where uh, my project, which is here, uh, is the third one in from the left, uh, is all, all of the projects have the same parameters, the same size. It's basically a five-story building of approximately the same size on a particular site. And what we've done is to, through the device of scaling, um, reiterate all of the projects into the one in a certain way, and then disintegrate it with the various view corridors that penetrate down the hill to the two rivers. So that was an early sketch, and this is a site plan on the right and site diagram on the left, so that the terraces are the, actually the sites left and right are the two terraces and the core is the building. And then at another scale entirely, all eight of them with this missing tooth, which happens to be a building they couldn't get a hold of, a house, an existing house up here. And all of that's uh, disintegrated by a view corridor down, down the hill. Now the basic form which is disintegrated and then tries to reintegrate itself is a pre-industrial form because with perestroika in countries like Yugoslavia, there's an immense gap of 40 years as in what was East Germany or as in what was East Germany or Poland or Hungary or any of them in the sense that there was not the commensurate development in those countries. And so the great rush now to make equivalent both a culture and its socioeconomic underpinning um, makes a great leap over industrial. So it's a post-industrial form in a certain way disintegrating a pre-industrial base. So it's a kind of a granary-like building, um, which maybe if I go back to this one, you can see that it's this kind of form that's then been disintegrated, this simple form. So the typical floor plan is made up of four one-bedroom units which disintegrate that cylindrical drum um, and is in, the, in, in its disintegration um, the rectilinearity of things is made up of ceramic tile and the concrete drum, uh, which is sort of the element from which this emanates or departs in a certain way, is the basis of that kind of dialectic uh, of the project itself. This is the ground floor plan um, with the view corridor coming through to the left itself going down river. Um, one of the elevations that shows the way in which this begins to operate. And the model um, of the project itself. All eight architects are working with a, a single uh, construction engineer builder uh, consortia, which is a, a very interesting study in privatization in Yugoslavia of both the government and planners and the private sector developing the entirety of the of the eight buildings. So this is one of the views of the model um, and at the entry itself coming in at the lower right. <coughs> this is a project that Margaret and I did together. Um, is a showroom for American Standard at IDCNY. Uh, where we have also been working with them to do product. We just finished a series of faucets and are now working on sanitary fixtures and fittings. So this is in uh, building one at IDCNY uh, that uh, uh, Pei and Guathmi Siegel remodel uh, jointly and is as it is in the Merchandise Mart in Chicago and probably at PDC here at Westwick. Uh, these buildings tend to have a 20 by 20 structural bay. And what we did um, was to develop a kind of 24 square, 10 by 10 by 10 cube in four layers 
of six chambers each, alternatively uh, white and black, white and black, as a kind of maze in a way, to present the product of the company, who, uh, um, and in the process, show the different ways of installation through a process of reconstruction. In other words, the first layer as you come in, and there is no central space, it's the first, it, and it's all built on water, um, so that everything is plumbed and, and, and works, in fact. Uh, in any case, the first layer is in uh, a lath uh, and studs, steel studs, um, and then um, goes through plaster, tile, and marble or granite, um, and as I say, is all plumbed, and, is, and that the paneling that runs from this metal paneling, etc., through the marble tiles, all in tiles, is fitted in, a certain, in, in such a way uh, so as to make convenient the demounting of all of the fittings, the sanitary fittings, so that, they, so that as new product comes out, they can then uh, 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 deal with it. And then a couple of chambers in the back for designers, in a sense. Margaret and I each did one, uh, but then after a certain amount of time, others will do it. Uh, and as I say, it's all plumbed on water, and so forth. So that was the basis of the project. Uh, this is from the atrium looking into the, pro uh, 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 into the showroom itself. A view on the periphery of it with the um, water and the uh, fittings, the attachments and everything working. Um, and on, on the other side, so this is actually uh, water as well. So the product, is, as you run round it, is also expressed. And then the chambers themselves, which I'll get to in one second, this is the fitting, and how it, in copper it goes together and so forth. So it's all mounted on water itself. The two different kinds of chambers, one is conventional, where product is shown in the conventional way. One inventories the product and puts it sort of off the wall, which is the way the project is named so that the very same line of stuff that you see conventionally that uh, one can take a client through in the very next chamber, in the black chamber, the same line, quote unquote, is then inventoried on the wall and perceived in a wholly different way. And so it just simply runs through the way the uh, uh, floor elements and the way that it's attached on the wall and so forth. And the rest are, 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 are shots showing alternatively left and right, black and white, the various ways in which these chambers invert in a certain way. And that's the one. That's the one I did at the end. Um, this is another project. Uh, possibly there's somebody in the room, Mark Lehman, who's from my office, who's getting a master's here. Uh, as a former student of mine in Chicago who worked on this project and will be glad to know that it's getting, it's, it's going ahead actually. Um, it's now scheduled to go out to bid uh, next week and it'll begin. We're doing an energy museum in, uh, in uh, north of Chicago uh, in a place called Zion, Illinois. Uh, and we've worked on it for a long time on and off in various iterations. And finally, the last iteration is now going ahead. It's a, a town that was, like many other towns, founded as a sort of a Bible town by German emigres a long time ago, the turn of the century. And influenced in many ways, orientationally, et cetera, how the plan developed. But to, suffice it to say, without belaboring it, this is the project here with trees that, and canals initially that ran back to the center of this biblically named town. Um, and it's a project that is through these iterations of beginning as a kind of uh, industrial shed or basilica form, um, then rotationally relating, uh, responding to forces around it, how it rotated, and then coming back to itself and being not quite able to complete itself is really the basis of the project. This is the plan of it, um, the uh, plan of the structure superimposed at another scale on the town of Zion itself, uh, and two different iterations of the plan in its 42-foot structural module 
as it rotates around. These are actually containers for the exhibition. We're working, uh, we're actually designing the exhibition spaces or modules and working with an exhibition designer who is constrained within those modules. And also on the outside of the building, on the periphery of the building, other machines uh, working with other um, utility companies. This is for Commonwealth Edison, the utility company in, in uh, northern Illinois. And there will be machines outside the building as well as inside the building. So the building is an energy education center for, uh, for children and adults and for college and graduate students hooked up to other such institutions throughout the world. And it's a very interesting project from my side because of the educational implication as well as formally in the way in which the information as this thing rotates round and goes out of sync in a certain way, it infects the detail. Uh, this is a plan at two different scales uh, of the entire building um, with the turnaround in front, etc., and the theater at the east end, and an enlargement of it, and then a further enlargement of at the uh, angle that it distorts of the various use of materials. So it's superimposed at different scales. And similarly, in elevation, the entire building blown up, the information of that rotation occurring uh, at certain increments, and then fretwork on the ends of the building that describe the information of the building superimposed on the facades at the end as well. So this is a model of the building. It's emergency egress patterns it, uh, uh, are the two disjunct, disjoint elements. And the, it, it's on, it, 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 uh, the client wanted very much to have a building with a minimum footprint that would be built very carefully because it's in a wetlands area. And so that's in many ways, uh, though the extension from the town center is also a part of it, uh, informed the model itself. The pieces of equipment are not yet shown on this, uh, uh, oh sorry, uh, that's with the roof taken off, which if you strain, I guess you can see. This is not ours, of course, um, but it's the next project. Um, it's a project uh, like Victoria, we too, even at my age and weight, don't get to build everything that I design, um, and this is one. This is not it. This is, uh, as you all know, is, uh, uh, at Burbank at the Disney Studio, and it's Graves' um, uh, administrative headquarters for, the, for Disney. Uh, and they conducted at one point a um, closed competition between Venturi Moore and our firm for the animation building, uh, which is located here. Graves' building is here. There are two grids that uh, are operative with respect to the Disney lot at Burbank. One is the Cartesian north-south grid, and the other is a northeast-southwest grid, which is a Burbank itself. And it's interesting because the campus grid of the studio is north-south, and yet, with the exception of the pediment and the figures in the tympanum, which are two oriented to that grid, Graves' building relates to the periphery. In other words, it's a more outward-oriented uh, 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 building that relates to the grid of Burbank and Alameda, which is here. The entrance to the studio is at this point, um, and our project, our submission to it, both in plan uh, uh, at one level and in elevation at another level, in a very early stage, uh, was like so. Now. We know, and I'm sure you do too, the um, interest with all the publicity that's occurred around Eisner and Disney of theming. And I have personally some reluctance to engage at this stage in my life in theming. Um, and so I knew very well that the other competitors would, and I really wanted to do, to operate within the program which are the two different functions, which is uh, 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 TV animation and feature-length film 
animation. So I broke the building based on the theory of enemies. These guys really hate each other. Uh, into two separate buildings in a certain way. Collegially only bringing them together at the point of a gallery, a cafeteria, and a, uh, and, and, a, and a small gym. And then since I had done a cameo, I had been invited by Frank Gehry, who was here, to do a cameo performance on, uh, appearance rather, on the Herman Miller project that he did in Sacramento, where he had done an abstract building and in contradistinction to it, I had done something that was more figurally uh, apparent. I asked Frank to do the, but basically would turn out to be the themed element, which happened to be the theater, which you'll see in a moment, which is a snake, which is here, which is the theater. Um, and so that kind of dialectic between the figural and the abstract in the two inverted ways, both in Sacramento and in Burbank, were very interesting to, for me to be involved in. In any case, the building is thought of uh, as a medina, as a building that when cracked open is different on the interior and on the, on the periphery is layered and basically opaque. And so the layering, some of which you may have noticed, which might have been apparent in the Yugoslavian, pro in, in the Belgrade project, uh, began here actually of superimposing the information of these disjointed grids, which are also shown by the structural grid superimposed, um, finds its way to the surface in a certain way. So that the outside, which has approximately the same kind of uh, 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 transparency glass, if you like, as the cut open section, this portion in here, but uh, it is done in layering. Uh, much in the same way that frankly the original campus buildings, the uh, original animation building, which is kind of an H-shaped building uh, that has many teeth to allow the uh, uh, um, animators at that, in that time to get north light. So these are various examples of the plans as they disintegrate. It really becomes a village and a place upon which you walk and can interact in a climate uh, that you can get out a lot, of course. This is a model of it with Frank's uh, snake theater uh, located here and the feature length film animation on the one side and the uh, 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 TV animation on the other and coming into this kind of village breaking it open and so forth which stands in opposition to the graves um, element here which is, is approximately the same volume but resists thematizing and thus developing a bookended pair of figural solids, one to the other. And so that was the attitude that informed that project. This is a project um, from which we were fired. Uh, but it was a terrific project that actually was very important for me in terms of developing in a certain way, which I hope I'm able to express. Um, it's a hotel, it's the Park Lane Hotel in Kyoto. Same Park Lane as in London. Um, and it's located as a part of a super block that's about so, that this forms an L shape to the super block, or of four blocks, because these are walking alleys, and the main streets are here. Now that quadrant in turn becomes a part of a larger quadrant, which has the main street of Kyoto, which is always a north-south, in every Japanese city, the main street is always a north-south street. The emperor's palace is always at the north end. The shrine is always to the east. So this turns out to be um, that the main street is here. The shrine, the, the east, the other center, so that's the, the north-south axis of the city. The other axis of the city leading to the shrine, which is here in the park, for those of you that have been in Kyoto, to the east, 
Um, so this is a very important sort of super block. Um, now, of course, then this becomes a missing element to an otherwise L-shaped form. Now, the hotel plan itself is also L-shaped, but as a topological L, as an L that goes this way uh, and this way, in the sense that this is the ground floor of the hotel, um, and the hotel at typical floors, as you'll see, are like so, are an L shape. But because the bottom three stories fill out the block, of course, because that's what a hotel always does, is to fill out the entirety because of its large um, meeting rooms and restaurants and uh, aggregation of people, the com communitas aspect of a hotel, it becomes a topological L. What we were charged to do, because the plan had been done, and we were brought in to do basically the elevation. And what we started to do was to begin to infect the plan in a certain way um, with the information of this topological L and then the, as, as the archaeology of the site itself with the super block and the entirety of what I tried to express earlier. So all that information in plan begins to penetrate using the device of congestion. In other words, as I hope to show in the elevation of the model photographs, the building becomes very congested at the point of entry. And it's done in ceramic tile. And it's done actually very, very simply. Um, so the, the building, the parts of the building that we wanted to be involved in, that is to say, the lobby, the governor's suite on the top floor, a, a tea house on the terrace, and so forth, which I'll, I'll show. The rest of the plan we left alone. Uh, and the uh, uh, and in fact was interesting because the symmetry that's implicit by the planners, the hotel designers, the interior decorators that had got there first, frankly, um, and were operating around an axis of symmetry, and frankly, we're looking to do a um, arched opening postmodernist building uh, because of the Park Lane people in London, and in, what we were trying to do was to do a building in Kyoto. Um, so that's the ground floor. This is the terrace. Now you see the L in plan, which is the beginning. This is the first typical floor. Um, and the only elements that we were involved in uh, were the tea house here and the exercise club here and the information of, of all of that uh, then in a Japanese garden on the third story of the deck above grade itself. And that's the upper level of the tea house. And the governor's suite on the whatever floor this says it is, the 12th and 13th floor, I guess it says, um, is here. Roof plan. And then the elevation. So this is the south elevation, which is the entrance elevation, which is here. This is the tea house. This is the... Um, health club, and there are certain elements in the mullionization of the building and the use of tile, which then only becomes colorful and congested um, at points of penetration in a certain way. So as you turn around the corner to the west elevation um, on the terrace itself, uh, this is the tea house and this is the uh, health club. And the back of the building, the north facade, opposite the entry, with the rear end, the north side of the governor's suite, and then the east elevation with the governor's suite up above, this is on the shrine side, um, and the penetration of the congestion, which then wraps on the corner, which wraps is best seen right there in the model. So the the we were operating within this very limited uh, dimension of uh, two tile depths, a very small dimension, approximately eight inches, approximately six inches, actually. Um,
And the last project I'm going to show is the one that we did get built in Japan, uh, which you, some of you may have seen published. Uh, it's in Fukuoka, and it's an apartment complex next to one by Michael Graves, again, which is also built, and across from one by Kisho Kurokawa. And now there's a whole new group um, and, uh, it's, uh, that, that are working with the same group in Japan. Um, Isozaki has got the pair, pair of towers, Ram Kulhas, uh, Mark Mack, um, Stephen Hall, etc. Et um, Oscar Tusquet. And this was a project that had the same relation, the same, like the EVA project or the one in uh, Belgrade, um, where the information given to Graves, the same information given to us, his building is literally right here. Um, on a street of this new development. And what I wanted to do was to um, do a project that on the one hand made clear uh, the fact that you can't very well, well build in a city that's bookended by Nagasaki and Hiroshima as an American and not have some sort of metal connection with the implications of what that stands for. Uh, on the other hand, I wanted to build something that in reflecting the program and the units and so forth, also um, localized the way in which it was designed. That is to, to, to reduce, to bring the scale down in a way that I've always understood in the times that I've been to Japan is Japanese in the sense of a breakdown of scale um, and an intimacy bereft of Western style semantics. Because when you go to Japan, you realize that the trace of Alexander the Great never got over the Sea of Japan and that there is no semantic condition present in work. It's really syntax and it's the way in which things are put together and so forth. One could spend a lot of time talking about that. But it was very important to me. And I also then wanted to, because of this book that I've been writing on forever, it seems, the failed attempts at healing the irreparable wound, of trying to reintegrate, to reconstruct, to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, to fail in trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And using the biblical myth, which goes throughout all religions, of the nostalgic desire to seek in connection with origins, which is represented here by a kind of an atrium that's gridded uh, that's uh, nine meters by nine meters by nine meters, you see it right there. And through the two other parts of disintegration and attempted reintegration, through a, a larger grid on the periphery, let's say two by two meters, um, and then failing to pull itself together and so forth. So that's what that was about. The ground floor plan is that. That's the uh, gridded atrium with the inaccessible center with shopping on the ground floor. A typical floor plan happens to be the third floor units organized on the perimeter. Um, uh, all of them getting light, as you find in Europe and Asia and everywhere except the United States. That doesn't require that uh, problematically enough. And a shadow diagram at the north where the building disintegrates, where they also require, where they, they, one would think by now, we would have a zoning vehicle that would cause us not to cast our shadow upon our neighbor and so forth. In any case, those are the requirements that set it up and those are requirements that I was very responsive to that I find more than reasonable. The top, next to the top floor was a six-story building. The fifth floor and sixth floor were duplex. We did the model apartments as well as Graves doing his. This is a typical elevation in tile in three different scales depending upon its relationship to the picture plane with a grid that attempts to stitch it back together again, but doesn't quite do it. But the attempted at stitching is the optimism implicit in the desire to reintegrate, to put things back together again. So those are the various elevations. And the key drawing is the section uh, with this uh, strange scale, as I hope to uh, persuade you with a slide of the interior court, um, which is gridded on all six sides in one by one meter, um, nine square uh, white grid. That's the building 
the building, Graves' building is to the left, who jointly shared the restaurant, which is the connecting link between the two. Um, it's made of ceramic tile, as I say, with the, depending upon the size, three different sizes. One tile return, mitered, epoxy, with the same color as the ceramic tile, uh, very beautifully made, no credit to me, but to the builder who was fabulous, working in Japan is fabulous, everybody there is a part of the same team, it's a great experience. If I never built here again, be no loss. I'm very happy building here, I can't tell you. And that, but that's the grid, that's Graves' building on the left, and the grid that t tries to pull it back together and so forth. The entry elevation to the north, Kurokawa's building is just across the street on the left, I think just off camera. Another shot of it. The ground floor. Entrance, elevator lobby, elevator cab to your right. Um, and then leading on to the door, which is the only access to that otherwise inaccessible, and then only for the tenants, the people, the condo, the owners of the building. And that's the, the grid in the center, the nine square piece with ramps that bring it up to a half meter above grade, but that's a one by one by one meter body of water that makes the center inaccessible. And the three other points going down to nothing, basically, you come up from this one. The model unit, duplex going to the top. And then a final shot of the building. Now, when I put the slides together, it was very interesting because, um, you know, we all, after all these years, we have a lot of slides. And um, I happened to notice in putting it together uh, a project from a very long time ago, uh, which was my bachelor's thesis at Yale. Um, so it seems that all that's really happened is the superimposition of a grid and a sort of storyline after all these 31 years. Thank you very much. What does it say out there? Thank you both very much. I think what we'll do is just, um, given the hour and the comfort level of those seats, uh, open open up the floor to questions and give you an opportunity to uh, ask either or both of our speakers questions that you might have on your mind. No, no questions. Uh, uh, The only difference is um, north, south, east, west. No, there really wasn't any difference in terms of the surface treatment. I mean, my budget was about like this big for that project. So the only difference really is in the inflection of, um, the, of the floating mirrors that are back to back and the light fixtures, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> it's an interesting idea. Yes, um, I have a problem being with Mr. Tiger. I can see it about uh, Mr. Jasko's manifesto. I was wondering if you wanted to maybe expand on that. Uh, I 
understand more about exactly who you are today in a, in a better way than most architects. Yeah, I, does this, I guess it does. Uh, all I was trying to get at was the, um, the, the work that I found Victoria doing with students uh, in terms of attempting to find a new way of developing sort of an urban, a potential for urban design, I found very exciting in the sense of individual people interacting at points of juncture. Um, but the call for what I perhaps misread of a cohesiveness is what I was having some difficulty with, with respect, because that's the difficulty that I have, which she also talked about, and had the same difficulty, which she talked about earlier, with the town plan of Seaside. In other words, the developing of uniform standards. In other words, when you develop uniform standards, or basically, put it another way, when one person has the authority to do a totality, say a new town, say Seaside, um, certain problems in, invariably come up, no matter who the architects are, because you mandate certain overriding characteristics uh, in terms of, uh, for example, a pitch of roofs and so forth. Um, so I have a problem with that, and I perhaps, as I say, misread her uh, statements at the end as a call for that. Uh, perhaps it wasn't, but in, in any case, that's, that was my misreading of it. Because in fact, when, when one saw what she did in studio situations, working with urban design, with large-scale design projects, uh, there was anything but that sort of overriding um, operative way of doing things. In fact, there was a, seemed to be a great encouragement, not just a disjunction for its own sake, but the uh, connective tissue, concerns about it, whether brought to fruition successfully or not, that I thought were really interesting. So that was... Yeah, you, that was my <coughs> you misread me. I may have misread Well, maybe I didn't say it right, but... <laughs> What I tried to say about Seaside is that, in fact, the, the town plan two-dimensionally, and it's um, two-dimensionally, it, it, I think it's a very beautiful plan. It works in terms of the interaction between people, the walkability, the mixed use, the hi hierarchical placement of civic structures. Yeah, of course, I have personally a problem with that because Wait, that's the, that's hi the hierarchical <laughs> problem. My problem with Seaside was actually the writing, the very restrictive writing of the building codes. For There are eight typological residential conditions, which are very, very strict. I mean, you have to end up with like the Charleston type, maybe two typologies that you could even develop on the site because people generally in that town want to build to the maximum envelope. And you have you're required to set back for porches. You're required with the roof. You're required setbacks on either side. And in the end, you're required to use this uh, all wood construction for houses. Um, wood operable windows that must have trim around them, and in general must be painted differently than the window themselves. It goes on and on. And but my big problem, and especially we, I went with Mike Davis's uh, class at Tijuana. And we visited um, a four quadrant um, pinwheel scheme that must have been done maybe in the early 70s with no building code, three dimensional building code. I mean, there were one story, three story houses built out of different materials. There was a kind of coherence within that kind of chaos that came about that I found very rich. At Seaside, Seaside is just. <coughs> Again, I, I respect the plan. I think that it works. I think it's a good model. But the, and Andres has himself elaborated upon this very restrictive set of guidelines that, in fact, don't allow architects to do very much. Yeah, but see, I think that it's... Uh, Within my, the residential my, context, My the problem is not the just the three-dimensional side. I think it comes out of the two-dimensional side. The very plan that you respect, I think, is a problem because it's a plan that looks backward to Europe to develop a hierarchy. 
It's a hierarchical plan. You said it yourself. There is a center, there are sub-centers, roads radiate from that center and so forth, as opposed to both the democratic and simultaneously alienating grid, the Spanish 100 by 100 metric grid of the United States. Wait, 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 wait. What about John so, Nolan? Oh, sure. I mean, there are other, other, other people that have worked in the United States at the turn of the century and beyond that have actually, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright for that matter, in his uh, one, one square mile city plan scheme. <clears throat> and, and Sarah, and, but uh, I guess he's not an American example, that have actually it, it gone beyond the grid. No, I understand that, but I'm saying the two ways, I mean, you know, I look back at the slides that you showed of, of your work with students and, you know, operating with the seams between student assigned areas, which is fr frankly far more interesting even two-dimensionally, yet alone three-dimensionally, than is the plan of seaside, which I find utterly uninteresting precisely because of its hierarchical model that looks back to an earlier time. I don't, I don't just think it's the three dimensions. It's not that it isn't cohesive, after all, Williamsburg is too, but it's the plan and it's, it's a, the very hierarchy that establishes that plan that, when ex that logically becomes hierarchically extended three-dimensionally. I think the plan it's is a problem. Really. I don't think it's a very American plan. I disagree, plan. because um, you're working with an 80-acre site. The logical place to put the uh, town center with a commercial office and uh, third-story residential, the big open space, the obvious place to put it on an 80-acre site is, in fact, center to it and it happens to be adjacent to the Gulf Coast. So, the, the reason for that is that anybody can walk within eight minutes no, towards that, that center. I think that's all right. So the diagonal routes are simply a way They just of reinforce that hierarchy. <laughs> that there's a center. So should, are you saying that we should have put the residential in no, the No, I'm not saying you should have done anything. I'm just saying in, con in contradistinction to a basically democratic open plan which is in a way unending, which has a philosophic underpinning of democracy as opposed to a, you know, okay, a, a situation I have, I have which sets up both the church, then. well I guess you do. No, uh, democracy <laughs> defined that way. I mean LA for me is an in terms of the plan incredibly democratic. And I find in terms of the, <clears throat> the suburban condition in LA, we're working now in Southgate, um, South Central LA, a very poor neighborhood in LA. The grid and the houses that you find there are just the same ones that you find in Hollywood, well, Hollywood, let's say Culver City and many other parts of LA. The housing types are the same. There's a kind of monotony for me personally that occurs with this kind of democratic condition. There's no question that hierarchy sets up just that. It says that one thing is more important than another. Well, yeah, I would and agree with that. And that's the, the interesting differentiation between these two attitudes. In any case, it's my opinion. Well, my opinion is that a that library, a civic building, a public open space, hierarchically, yes. is more important than the residential fabric. Absolutely. But when it all focuses on a center and a control and an authority, which whether you call it Robert Davis, or Andres Duany, or anything, okay? When you assign a name to it, you say, that's the center, and then there are a series of subsets, secondary centers, you know, it's, it, it, it's just, it's another example of Leon Creer, well, you know, sort of as an authoritarian yeah. okay, center. Okay, I, I can see what you're saying. And I think it begins to show in Seaside. Well, which is why in the studio, I mean, we're exploring other Absolutely. options. Absolutely, and that's Although why the other even, option is very interesting. Even in that other scheme, the uh, main open space was in the center because it was easily accessible from all the different yeah. sectors. Now, I mean, I'm trying, um, <clears throat> in the work that we're exploring other options, both in terms of what the definition of a street might be, yeah. the, de the whole notion of hierarchy is a big question, our civic buildings, I mean, if we're living in a privatized society, basically, what do civic buildings mean? What do they mean to us? Well, I think, I mean, you, know, TV society, you know, it's like, Victoria, Who it's sort of like, um, you, have an, you have a choice. I mean, obviously, you have to, you know, shopping there are hierarchies. Hierarchically more shopping mall is one example, a library, any of these things are examples. You can either look backward to an earlier model and a planning scheme, or in the development of a library, like BV's Chicago Public Library, which uses um, a 
an 18th century model out of Paris of Henri Le Brousse's Bibliothèque saint jean which has nothing to do with the forward-lookingness of a city and of a nation, or you can attempt to throw yourself into the black hole of the future and say, gee, what might a library be, or a city, a town plan, albeit one on the side of the sea, by the sea, by the beautiful sea, whatever it is. You have those options, and I think you're, you're exploring both. One was in a studio setting, which I found, frankly, much more, see, I thought your work in detail is not hierarchical, which makes it very interesting. I mean, the detail of the lighting fixtures, which are really memorable for me, you know, are in the smallest detail of it, it's not hierarchical. I mean, the vertical and horizontal elements and the way you explain very carefully in this lighting that drops down below, suspension system, those aren't hierarchical solutions. And all I'm saying is, you know, you found yourself at a certain point in your life working with Andres and Liz and for Robert Davis doing a certain kind of, you know, precedent oriented, looking back well, to establish. Well, Robert before that. Certainly, mm. of course. Um, to establish a certain validation, and it really doesn't show up in your own work. Your own work has a kind of a brilliant non-hierarchical detailing sense, like the scheme you were working with those students, and that's much more interesting to me personally. It's just a particular bias. I think by showing the, the, the seaside... There was thing, a hierarchy, though, in that student project. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Well, in terms of the central open space, which was hard to I see think it's a function models. of how you perceive your own time. And I think that in your work and the architecture I itself, Hey, but it's in a building thing. you have a hierarchy. In this last wonderful building that you showed, you have a central... Yeah, that's part of its problem. I don't think it's a problem. It's the central. So they, they may want to ask, but we can maybe conduct this ourselves again. Yeah, it seems like it's drifting into a private conversation here. Why don't we take one more question, and then I think we'll have to break. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that's what I'm doing with the with the trying to see if I can see if what the data is. That might be what differentiates the problems that you're having in place when you have that two sides of the argument. Because the two sides are going to be not only where the data is, but the data is going to be the data. It seems to be that there's a kind of 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 very although I have to say that uh, this I went to the called four modulos in Tijuana that are uh, 1600 feet by 1600 feet and in the center of each modulo is in a public open space. There may be three blocks this way, three blocks that way. The center public space has a school in it in one quadrant, a uh, wholesale market in another, and if that had been filled up with housing, it would be completely different condition. So there's this very subtle kind of hierarchy being set up there, which has to do with pedestrian use, really. Yeah.
Well, sure, like Lincoln Boulevard full of all of that stuff. Imagine it, imagine it eight stories high with presidential buildings on it. It would be a completely different street. Or San Vicente, for that matter. But San Vicente still is a primary street because it's a much wider street, it's tree-lined, etc. I think we should all go to Houston yeah. and, and study that city. I'm not, can I, I'm still in the Learn something about the grid the and uh, lack of zoning. Oh yeah, no, I agree. Thank you all very much. I feel like you're